The House uh, Foreign Affairs Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point. All members will have five days to submit testimony and statements, extraneous materials, and questions for the record, subject to the limitations of uh, our rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address uh, that we forward to them or contact the full committee staff. Please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourselves after you finish speaking. Consistent with House Resolution 965 and the accompanying regulation, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they're not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum present, and I'll recognize myself for an opening statement pursuant to notice. We're holding a hearing today entitled Renewable Energy Transition, a case study of how international collaboration on offshore wind technology benefits American workers. I'll now recognize myself uh, for an opening statement. On May 10th, in the 9th District of Massachusetts, uh, we welcome the long-awaited final federal approval of Vineyard Wind One, the nation's first commercial-scale offshore wind farm and a linchpin to offshore wind all down the eastern coast of the United States. The Biden administration's announcement means that wind turbine construction can finally begin as soon as next year off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, heralding a new era of wind energy across the United States. Uh, I'm incredibly proud to represent the district that's on the cusp of such technological innovation and workforce innovation. It's this anticipation of a burgeoning, clean, and job-creating energy industry that inspired the organization of this hearing today. We will seek to better understand the current state of the United States and European offshore wind markets, as well as how we might cooperate and more uh, work together more closely with our transatlantic allies to ensure that our citizens are able to make the most of the economic benefits uh, of renewable energy transition. Before I continue with my opening uh, statement, I'd like to offer my sincere thanks to Ranking Member Fitzpatrick for participating in this hearing. His presence here today underscores the bipartisan support of American workforce, uh, and, and the support of the American work, workforce, and the hope that we can continue to work together to highlight transatlantic cooperation as an avenue of support to our constituencies. Now, let me now turn to the topic uh, we're all here to discuss today, the rapid growth of the American offshore wind industry and the lessons we can learn uh, from the maturation of the European market. Uh, the Vineyard Wind Project is crucial, and it's the first step in the United States offshore wind, but I can confidently say it's only the beginning. In late March, the Biden administration announced a set of bold actions that will cat catalyze offshore wind energy, strengthen the domestic supply chain, and create good-paying union jobs. Specifically, the administration set a goal to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind in the United States by 2030. Meeting this target will trigger more than $12 billion per year in capital investment and create tens of thousands of good-paying union jobs with more than 44,000 workers employed in offshore wind by 2030 and nearly 33 additional jobs in communities supported by offshore wind activity. The, the administration hopes to generate enough power to meet the demand of more than 10 million American homes for a year and avoid 78 metric tons of CO2 emissions. The Biden administration's commitments to offshore, the offshore wind industry will support an already burgeoning market. There are currently 34 proposals for offshore wind development, uh, which includes 27 projects in various stages of planning and development. The U.S. is set to see a huge growth in offshore wind, which will help mature the industry and continue, importantly, to continue to drive costs down. While I'm incredibly optimistic about the potential for growth in the U.S. market, we must not forget that this would not be possible had it not been for the monumental achievements of our European partners. The first European offshore wind farm was installed in 1991 in Denmark, and since then, Europe has become the world leader in the industry. The European offshore wind sector attracted almost $32 billion, U.S. dollars, of investment last year, a record amount, and today roughly 77,000 Europeans have access to high-paying 
union jobs in the offshore wind industry alone. Europe's offshore wind industry is expected to continue to grow in part because of the favorable governmental policies that exist there. The EU sees renew renewable energy in general and offshore wind in particular as key to meeting their greenhouse gas reduction targets and related goals. Declining costs are also contributing to Europe's offshore wind growth. With that being said, as we consider Europe's progress in the offshore wind industry, we must also explore how we here in Congress can facilitate our own nation's growth in this critical green energy sector by understanding lessons learned by our friends across the Atlantic. As a proud representative of a coastal district pioneering technological innovation and renewable technologies, I want to do everything I can do to support the development of this industry. That's why I've introduced legislation that creates a federal grant program to assist colleges and universities, state and local governments, unions, nonprofits to advance an offshore wind workforce. We also have been able to secure appropriation funding for curriculum development at the Bristol Community College, which is National Offshore Wind Institute, uh, as that's located in my district as well. And, and as the chair of the subcommittee, I've committed to exploring ways that the transatlantic alliance can help both Europe and the United States reach their climate goals. And I hope to continue that exploration with today's hearing. The question now is how the United States and Europe can coordinate and cooperate to maximize the growth of this vitally important and, and the U.S. burgeoning industry. To answer this critical question, my colleagues and I have invited a group of incredibly knowledgeable experts with a diverse range of professional experiences. They include CEO of Wind Europe, uh, Giles Dixon, uh, the American Clean Power Association's Heather Zeichel, and Vineyard Wind CEO Lars Peterson. As long-standing experts in this field, you'll be able to give concrete recommendations on how the U.S. and the EU can bolster cooperation in areas such as supply chain development, foreign direct investments, and workforce training. Uh, we thank you for being here and, and working through, uh, you know, uh, seven different roll calls occurring in the midst of this committee. Transitioning to renewable energies presents yet another opportunity for the American economy to lead the world on innovation and job creation for the domestic and global workforce uh, as, as well. I'm honored to be working on this issue and I welcome everyone's participation uh, in the House Foreign Affairs Committee's first hearing ever, uh, first hearing ever on offshore wind. Uh, now, I, I, I trust we've been uh, joined by the ranking member uh, as he's trying to uh, work around his schedule. I believe he's here. So I recognize Representative Fitzpatrick if he's not here. Uh, we will take Representative Fitzpatrick as he arrives, given the circumstances we're working with. I'll now introduce our wish assistant, and I want to thank you again for being here. Uh, Giles Dixon is the CEO of Wind Europe, the leading association and voice of the wind industry in Europe. Ms. Heather Zeichel is the CEO of American Clean Power Association, the leading federation of renewable energy companies uh, uh, expediting the advancement of clean energy as a dominant power. Uh, in America. Uh, Mr. Lars Peterson is the CEO of Vineyard Wind, uh, a leading developer of offshore wind projects on the outer continental shelf of the United States. I'll now recognize the witnesses for five minutes each uh, without objection. Uh, you're, you've prepared a written statement and that will become part of the official record uh, and your remarks can play off of that. Mr. Dixon uh, will now be recognized for your opening statement. Thank you very much, Chairman Keating, for the invitation to testify before your subcommittee and for the kind words that you have said about offshore wind in Europe. Offshore wind is now 3% of all of the electricity we consume in Europe. Europe has 120 operating offshore wind farms, in total 5,500 offshore wind turbines. It's 26 gigawatts of operating capacity today. And that number we expect to rise by 2030 to 114 gigawatts. Beyond that, the EU has set a target of 300 gigawatts by 2050. Why is there so much interest in offshore wind in Europe? Of course, climate change is a key political driver, but there's a strong recognition among governments and society that offshore wind makes economic sense. As you have said, the costs have come down markedly. 
it is now cheaper to build new offshore wind in most of Europe than it is to build new coal, gas or nuclear power plants. There were wider economic benefits as well as falling energy bills for consumers. As you've said, 77,000 jobs in Europe today. That number is rising, we expect, to 200,000 jobs by 2030. Every time we build an offshore wind turbine, that generates on average $18 million of economic activity. And as you've noted already, sir, uh, last year Europe invested $31 billion uh, despite COVID in new offshore wind farms. The technology continues to develop. The average size of the turbine we're installing at the moment is around 8 megawatts. By 2030, it will be 15 megawatts. That means the turbines are more powerful, more efficient. Generally now, the capacity factors of new offshore wind farms are around 50%. So it's an increasingly stable form of electricity generation. What are the lessons that we have learned? What are the challenges we still face? And if you were to ask us, what, what, what advice would we give to you? I have five uh, quick observations. First, maritime spatial planning is very important. The 300 gigawatts that the EU wants by 2050 will take up 7% of all of the EU's sea space. So it's important that countries, in your case states, take a very long-term approach to maritime spatial planning. It's important also that we move away from the silo approach to maritime spatial planning. By the silo approach, I mean the approach whereby you do fishing activity in a certain area, the shipping lanes are somewhere else, military activity somewhere else, then environmental protection zones, and then energy in some other areas. There is scope for multiple use of the sea space between the different economic and societal interests. Two examples, fishing. It is possible to fish inside offshore wind farms, provided it is passive or pelagic surface fishing. A few wider observations about fishing communities. The offshore wind industry routinely consults fishermen about the location and layout of offshore wind farms. We pay compensation to them where necessary. In many countries of Europe, we in fact agree upfront with the fishing industry where we should be building offshore wind farms and how much we should be building. We're also striving for happy coexistence with military activity. On offshore wind turbines, there are many sensors and cameras which are accumulating invaluable data and images. And in some countries in Europe, we're exploring with the military authorities how we can share this data and images with them. My second main observation would be the importance of investments in electricity grids. If we look how much money do we need to spend over the coming years in Europe in offshore wind, actually, we'll be spending more money on the grids than on the offshore wind farms themselves. It's important not only to spend money on the offshore grids, but also the reinforcements of the onshore grids. Thirdly, it's so important that the permitting rules and procedures should be as simple as possible. We try and have one-stop shops in Europe wherever we can, so the developer only needs to deal with one single authority. Of course, in uh, the United States, there will always be a role for both federal and state uh, authorities. I think our advice to you would be always to ensure clear demarcation lines between their respective responsibilities in the permitting process. Fourthly, investment in the supply chain and support for the supply chain. The best support any administration can give to the offshore wind supply chain is clarity about how much you want to build in the future and where and when the auctions or the leasing rounds will take place. With that clarity, the industry then invests in new factories in the supply chain. And the supply chain is not just the companies building the offshore wind farms and the turbines, it's the shipping industry, it's the crane manufacturers. Crucially, it's the ports as well. It's so important to invest in port infrastructure and, of course, to invest in skills development. Fifth and final observation, um, a major challenge for us in Europe is coordinating the activity of the different national administrations, coordinating the investments they're making in new grid infrastructure, coordinating their rules and regulations, for example, on health and safety, certification of 
vessels, uh, the lightings and the markings for aviation that you put on the uh, turbines, and coordination also of when and where different national auctions are taking place. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your remarks. Uh, thank you for telling me what, what an impressive uh, level of achievement already. And, and the things that you outlined, uh, we are, are issues we are indeed dealing with uh, here in the U.S. I now recognize uh, Heather Zeichel uh, for your opening statement. Thank you for being with us. Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick, members of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Europe, Energy and Environment, thank you for the invitation to testify at today's hearing. My name is Heather Zeichel and I'm the CEO of the American Clean Power Association, the National Renewable Energy Trade Association that unites the power of offshore wind, land-based wind, solar storage and transmission companies. Today, we released our first Clean Power Annual, which is a testament to the record growth and investment in the renewable energy sector. The data shows our industry employs more than 415,000 Americans and has invested more than $334 billion in the U.S. economy since 2005. I appreciate the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee's focus on the offshore wind industry. Collaboration with Europe will allow domestic market participants to draw from lessons learned and best practices from a more mature European market. Smartly growing our domestic offshore wind market and supply chain will create hundreds of thousands of jobs in the American offshore wind industry and unlock billions of dollars of investment, allowing us to meet our climate and economic goals. The American offshore wind industry is on the verge of becoming a substantial source of clean energy close to the largest population centers on the US East and West coasts. ACP members are committed to building a thriving, successful domestic offshore wind industry but the American offshore wind industry is playing catch up to Europe and Asia. At the end of, 2022, at the end of 2020, there were over 24,000 megawatts of installations in Europe and the UK, over 10,000 megawatts in Asia Pacific. While there are just 42 megawatts of domestic offshore wind in operation today, the US market has tremendous potential with over 14,000 megawatts of offshore wind currently in permitting and pre-construction phases. In addition to creating jobs, to date, offshore wind companies have proposed investing at least $2.9 billion across manufacturing, ports, vessels, workforce development, and research areas. States have encouraged some of this localization of jobs and economic benefits through the offshore wind energy procurement process. In fact, some states such as New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Virginia are requiring offshore wind developers to detail how hiring and sourcing of goods and services locally would drive economic development with an emphasis on disadvantaged communities. These investments will increase as more projects advance and as regulatory certainty continues to improve, bringing enormous economic benefits to, community, to communities across the country. To realize these jobs and investments, Congress can help the offshore wind industry by fully resourcing permitting agencies, supporting workforce training programs, and creating incentives to build a domestic supply chain and offshore wind vessels. Offshore wind investments and jobs depend in part on a timely and predictable federal permitting process. Led by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, many different cooperating agencies participate in the permitting process. Certainty around auction timing and volume of additional lease areas in federal waters also provide developers and manufacturers with the necessary confidence to make long-term domestic supply chain decisions. To help create more market certainty, ACP asked that Congress increase funding for BOEM and other agencies that permit offshore wind projects, fully fund the Port Infrastructure Development Program, and reauthorize Title 41 of the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council that helps with interagency coordination. Manufacturing of large offshore wind components and construction at sea requires a specialized workforce. Bills such as the Offshore Wind Jobs and Opportunity Act, which creates a grant program to spur offshore wind workforce training, can help expedite that process. Before the completion of a domestic supply chain and construction vessels, the American offshore wind industry will have to use foreign components and some specialized foreign flag construction vessels. There simply is not enough time to ramp up domestic capacity prior to an initial wave of offshore wind facilities being constructed. And companies were understandably not willing to invest the billions of dollars to build vessels or a domestic supply chain previously, given the lack of certainty about whether offshore wind projects would ever successfully get through the federal permitting process to establish a market to serve. 
Additional policy levers can help drive an even greater degree of domestic manufacturing of offshore wind components and vessels on a more ambitious timeline. The size and cost to transport offshore wind components makes the U.S. an attractive market, but it will require capital intensive manufacturing facilities and a substantial upgrade of American port infrastructure to accomplish. Congress can help spur these investments by creating incentives for facilities, equipment, vessels, and domestic production, updating trade policy, leveraging complementary financing pathways, and funding research and development. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today during this historic time for the offshore wind industry, and I look forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you very much. A great segue uh, in between uh, our, our witnesses. And now I'm going to pass the chair to uh, Representative Vice Chair Spanberger, who will recognize uh, Representative Fitzpatrick uh, now for his opening statement. I will now recognize Representative Fitzpatrick. Patrick for his opening statement, and then we'll be continuing on with our witnesses. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and also to Chairman Keating. Um, and thanks to our witnesses for joining us today to discuss ways to collaborate uh, with our transatlantic partners on offshore wind technologies uh, that we hope will provide sustainable energy resources and significant benefits to American workers in the future. Um, as was uh, alluded to earlier, wind energy is not a new concept in the United States, uh, but offshore wind energy is still very much in its infancy. And while European nations are undeniable leaders in, uh, in offshore wind energy, the United States has a long history of advancing energy development uh, and making significant technological strides, uh, both individually uh, and through partnerships with our European allies. The development of offshore wind technologies is no different, uh, but it is vital that it not come at the expense of other energy industries or jobs. Uh, the United States has a strong interest in supporting research and development of offshore wind technology. Uh, the United States not only has tremendous wind energy potential, but it, uh, it is also an important area in which we need to be uh, a leader in, in order to effectively compete uh, with uh, uh, the CCP uh, and other uh, entities around the world. Uh, we need uh, to be out front on this technological development, uh, not fighting uh, to keep up with our adversaries. Investments in these technologies will establish the United States presence in the competitive landscape of sustainable energy <clears throat> and position us better to compete uh, with the PRC moving forward. However, uh, we must remember to keep the interests of the American workers and industries among our top priorities. Uh, we must ensure that we uh, have the necessary vessels and infrastructure in place to safely and effectively uh, develop and install offshore wind farms. Uh, and we must also be sure that we are taking into account any potential implications on other industries like fishing and shipping. To that end, we must carefully evaluate the effects of scaling uh, this industry and the effects that it would have uh, on uh, our port infrastructure and the fisheries that may be impacted by these installations. Uh, it is my hope uh, that our witnesses can detail uh, what has been done, what can be done in the private sector to better prepare the United States and our European partners to develop uh, these new technologies. Thanks for being here. I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Peterson for his opening remarks. Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Fitzpatrick and members of the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Europe, Energy, the Environment and Cyber. My name is Lars Stanning Peterson and I'm the CEO of Vineyard Wind. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on how international collaboration on offshore wind benefits American workers. I've been fortunate to work on commercializing offshore wind since the early days of this industry, and I've worked on more than 15 offshore wind projects in all stages throughout my career. In the mid 2000s, wind, offshore wind was an expensive niche technology in Europe, and now it's the lowest cost, fastest expanding energy sector in much of Northern Europe. What we learned in those early days was that in order to drive down costs, we needed to scale up the industry in terms of project size and technology, while ensuring that bottlenecks were addressed early on to create predictability in project delivery. Boom bust cycles would negatively impact the ability for companies to make long-term investments in infrastructure assets, supply chain, and workforce. Scaling up is directly tied to technology and nowhere is this more evident than in offshore wind. Wind turbine generator size has increased by a factor of almost six over the last 15 years. Vineyard Wind 1 will be built with the 13 megawatt Halyard X turbine from General Electric, the largest commercially available wind turbine in the world. 
Similarly, lift boats have increased significantly in size. Cables are deployed with higher electrical ratings and foundation sizes have increased to be installed in deeper waters. Importantly, scaling up also means expanding the pool of highly skilled, dedicated workers engaged in developing and building safe projects, in addition to manufacturing the needed components. While there's certainly much that should be learned from the experiences elsewhere, I want also to be clear that in my opinion, the future of the US offshore wind industry is poised to be thoroughly and uniquely American. A great example of this is our project labor agreement with the Southeast Massachusetts building trade, which was signed just two weeks ago in New Bedford, Mass. It will now set the benchmark for building offshore wind projects in the US. The PLA ensures that 500 of the 1000 construction jobs that will be created as a result of Wind Win One will be good paying local union jobs. The agreement also includes, includes aggressive targets for diversity, equity and inclusion to ensure that the workforce resembles the communities where we are building the project. Equally important to the many jobs in construction a significant opportunity in the long term to maximize job creation in this industry remains in the supply chain. And for the first project, we have sought to work with US-based suppliers wherever possible. We have partnered with a company called Linkson headquartered in North Carolina to provide a substation that will connect our first project to the ISO New England grid and with Southwire headquartered in Georgia to manufacture and install the onshore cable. It's impossible to talk about offshore wind without mentioning the Jones Act. Wind and Wind fully supports the Jones Act that will comply with its transport requirements. However, as was mentioned before, due to the infancy of the industry in the US, there are currently no US flagged jack-up installation vessels large enough to install the components for our first project. For Wind and Wind 1, we sought to turn these installation challenges into opportunity. We have worked with our international contractors to ensure that logistics other than the specialized transport and installation vessels will be provided by companies like FOSS Maritime headquartered in Seattle. FOSS FOSS Maritime will also be using union labor that will ensure U.S. mariners get valuable experience working on the first large-scale offshore wind project in the U.S. Leaning on my personal experiences from Europe growing the industry, I see three areas where the federal government working with state, uh, state and local stakeholders can make a significant impact on the future of this industry. The U.S. offshore industry will grow at a much faster rate than the European industry did in the early 2000s, and therefore addressing these challenges early on will be key. One, offshore wind is fundamentally a marine construction industry and the components being manufactured are of such large dimensions that they can only be transported by sea. Currently, the eastern seaboard where most of the projects are located do not have a significant number of ports, sufficient number of ports with the right specifications and significant investments are needed to bring these port developments forward in due time to be ready for project construction and not least to attract manufacturing. Similarly, significant investments in vessel capacity will also be needed, which will provide opportunities for the yachts in the Mexican Gulf with experience from the oil and gas industry. Two, the electrical grid needs to be redesigned for a significant inflow of power produced on the outer continental shelf, so the power can get from the coastline to the load centers. Grid development is inherently complex to permit, timelines are long, and regulations are complex with state and federal agencies overseeing permitting access to interconnection points and funding of upgrades of the grid. Three, educating and training a workforce for this new industry is essential. Thousands of workers needs to be trained for this industry in the coming years, and it represents a significant opportunity to provide well-paying jobs for coastal communities that will eventually become lifelong careers. The Vineyard Wind One project represents a giant step forward for the US offshore wind industry, but it's only the beginning. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson. And I'm now turn the chair back to Chairman Keating. I'd like to thank the vice chairman. Uh, now recognize, and we're trying to do this to, to accommodate voting. Uh, and she, since she hasn't voted on this yet, we'll recognize, chair recognizes Representative Titus, and we'll check with Representative Schneider where he is. Representative Titus, uh, you have five minutes for your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this interesting hearing. I think we have a lot to learn from our European neighbors about how to develop this source of energy. We seem to trying to move forward in renewable, but we seem to put most of our focus on solar. Uh, that is certainly true for Nevada. We've got lots of big wide open spaces and we have wind, but the wind comes in short gusts. It's not this steady breeze that you find in some places where the industry is so successful. First, I wonder if there are any uh, 
companies or organizations or research and development that's looking at technology that will accommodate those kinds of um, weather conditions like we have in Nevada? And second, what can we do to partner and help countries like Kosovo, for example? I met with some people from there today. They are getting the political will to move off of coal and onto renewables, but they don't have the resources to do it. And we know if we're not there to help, China is only too willing to step in and, and build infrastructure. So if you could answer those two things, I would certainly appreciate it. Anybody? Sir, I, I'm happy to answer. I just, I saw the chairman was speaking and I didn't want to speak over him. Um, I'm so so, hearing him. Yep. Um, so let me answer your second question first and and uh, and your first, and, and we'll go from there. Um, you know, I think the, the point you make about partnering with other countries that are committed to pursue clean energy economies is something that's near and dear to our heart. And in fact, um, we've opened a dialogue with the Biden administration to look at what can they do through the international funding mechanisms, whether that's at the XM or DFC, how can we make sure to, how can we work together constructively to make, to um, help other countries decarbonize? So I think there's obviously the, um, you know, like our, our industries will do what we can um, as we have a, very, a, a global footprint to help countries deploy clean energy. But I also think there's an important opportunity to work with this administration. And that's certainly something we've prioritized at ACP. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, those foreign dollars and investments can go a long way towards meeting our broader climate goals. The, and for, you know, for the, for your question about technology, I mean, the exciting thing about working in the renewable space is that there is just ongoing, whether it's storage, whether it's wind, um, solar, there's ongoing R&D, the technology continues to get better. And part of what we released in our um, report today was the significant decreases that we've seen in the cost of wind and solar over 70 and 90% respectively. Um, so we're gonna continue on that trajectory, but to your point, we also know that we need to keep investing in research and development and our, our companies absolutely do that. I think as I think about the challenge, the specific challenge in Nevada that you pose, you know, you are right that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. But I also think that's really what's exciting about the storage work that we're doing um, at, at our association because that those storage units um, and, and the projects that we can deploy with them can help create and store that energy um, so that you're, you're, you're evening out your ability to deploy the electrons when, when and where you need them. So, um, you know, I'd be happy to engage in a broader dialogue with you, uh, Congresswoman, but, but that's kind of where I see um, the big opportunity and the, and the big play, frankly, coming down the, coming down the, the pike. Great, thank you. Is it Mr. Chairman speaking? I didn't mean to speak over him. He was speaking for you. Oh. Well, thank you. Then I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative Titus. Just trying to determine if Representative Schneider has voted already in this series. Uh, Representative Schneider. I, the chair recognizes then uh, Representative Deutsch for five minutes. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I appreciate it. Thanks for calling this hearing and thanks also to the witnesses for your thoughtful and in interesting testimony. Uh, as the founder and co-chair of the Bipartisan House Climate Solutions Caucus and a member of Congress from South Florida, uh, I know firsthand how important it is that we embark on this transition to renewable energy with realism as much as with uh, urgency. And I believe strongly I believe strongly that pricing carbon will help us move forward along that path. That's why I, I'm proud to reintroduce the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. Uh, by placing a price on carbon emissions, uh, the U.S. can reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050, return 100 percent of the net revenue back to American families. Legislation will help families afford any increase in energy cost. But the development of green technologies is also inextricably linked to energy security. So. I'm a strong supporter of clean, renewable offshore wind energy, and I have appreciated the witnesses' informative testimony. Um, I wanted, uh, Ms. Eichel, I think for you, I, I wanted to ask 
Um, given that a significant portion of clean energy technologies are manufactured using rare earth minerals, uh, the market for that is monopolized by China, I'm hopeful that the US and EU can work to forge secure supply chains, recycling environmentally sound domestic development of these critical minerals. So I, I would ask, if I may, about the stance of EU member countries in supply chain, uh, with regard to supply chain monopolization of China and how the US and EU can work together to secure supply chains and foster domestic development of rare earth min minerals. Um, well, thank you for uh, your leadership, Congressman, on, on um, the broader climate agenda as, as the head of a trade association that thinks about um, energy and climate policy every day. We wouldn't um, be in the lucky place we are without um, leadership uh, from you and, and, and others on this uh, subcommittee. Your question is obviously something that I wake up every day thinking about, which is how do we both address the challenge with China, but also take advantage of this opportunity to create jobs? And I think there's a robust dialogue happening with the administration about, um, you know, how do we, what are, what's the set of incentives that we need to, um, uh, that, that we need to build a domestic supply chain? And you know, it, you are a thousand percent correct that um, you know cri critical mineral concerns are not going away overnight. So, to that end, I think there's a couple things that that we are doing. First and foremost, looking at creating domestic supply chains once the projects are permitted. Um, so, you know, offshore wind companies are are looking at this opportunity and saying, okay, how are we going to you know, avoid the challenges that we have today in, in, in solar and wind and make sure that we're being really directive about um, our, uh, our existing U.S. manufacturing presence. And part of, what, part of what's exciting to me is that there's this conversation happening in Congress and with the White House about, about those supply chain issues. And I think we have a real opportunity with, um, you know, sort of some of the core components in the bipartisan infrastructure framework, as well as some of the, the, the components being considered for reconciliation, creating those incentives for facilities, equipment, and vessels, um, domestic production incentives. Um, there's a suite of trade policies as well that we're working on with the administration. Um, and then funding and research and development, as you know well, um, you know, thinking about what are alternatives to these critical minerals, how do we invest in recycling, all of those pieces of the puzzle are things that our industry is investing on and, and obviously looking to leverage the important opportunity that we have um, sort of with the reconciliation package to make sure that the R&D piece of this, um, as, as well as the domestic supply chain components are front and center as we're considering um, our priorities in, in the broader reconciliation package. Thanks very much. I, um, I appreciate the thoughtful answer. And um, this is for, for all of the broad conversations we have uh, about energy and renewables. This is a, a piece that we have to address um, as we go forward if we're going to do this in a, in, in a really sustainable way. So um, I appreciate the opportunity, uh, Mr. Chairman, to engage in this conversation. This is a really important hearing. I'm glad you're holding it. And I yield back. Thank you, Representative Deutsch. Chair uh, recognizes Representative Cicilline for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Keating, for calling this hearing. Uh, and as you all know, my home state of Rhode Island was home to the nation's first offshore wind farm, uh, helping to really diversify Rhode Island's energy grid and providing Rhode Islanders with clean and reliable electricity. So Rhode Island is really happy to be serving as a model with what offshore wind can mean for our future a future free from fossil fuels. And I know it will help inform work in other places like Massachusetts and all throughout our country. Um, and as I think you know, Mr. Chairman, we are really far behind our European uh, counterparts in terms of installation and China not far behind them. In 2020, the US had under 50 gigawatts generated from offshore wind, while the UK and China each had approximately 10,000. So we have to make real investments and a real commitment to renewable sources of energy. and. This is an opportunity, I think, for those of us in the Northeast, particularly, to really maintain a leadership position. So uh, thank you to our, our witnesses. I mean, Rhode Island, I think, has a great experience with respect to balancing this wonderful new energy source and the fishing industry. And 
I think we had a really good process that listened very carefully to the uh, folks in the fishing industry. And I'd love to know from from you, uh, uh, Mr. I'm, I'm not sure the best person to answer this, but really what has Europe done to work with commercial fishing interests to ensure that they can work responsibly while also expanding offshore wind installations? And are there things we have to be worried about beyond commercial fishing in terms of that broader impact to marine wildlife? Uh, Maybe Mr. Dixon, you could. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much, um, sir, for the question. So European offshore wind farm developers routinely consult the local fishing industries about the location and the layout of offshore wind farms. And there are examples of where we've changed the layout so that they can sail their fishing vessels between the rows of turbines to do passive and pelagic fishing. We talk to them also about compensation for any loss of catch that they might suffer. But in fact, our experience has been with offshore wind because there were so many mollusks growing on the turbines, there are four tons of shellfish on the foundations of each individual offshore wind turbine. Also, the seabed is undisturbed because there's no bottom trawling. There's no dredging going on inside the offshore wind farm. So it's good for fish stocks. And many fishing communities end up welcoming the presence of an offshore wind farm. What is crucial is that there should be, in the European case, it's nationwide, and perhaps in your case, statewide agreements between the offshore wind industry and the fishing industry about how much offshore wind there's going to be, where it's going to be built, and what the deal will be for the fishermen. To give you one concrete example, the Dutch government recently invited the Dutch fishing industry and the Dutch wind industry to a hotel on the coast of the Netherlands for three days, and they did not let them out until they'd reached an agreement on the plan for offshore wind and its coexistence with the fishing industry for the next 10 years. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think one of the other things uh, that has been remarkable is the support in the EU uh, for offshore wind and for renewable energy projects broadly um, comes really from all across the political spectrum. And I'm wondering whether you have any advice for us, either you or Mr. Henderson, on you know how we might be more successful at managing uh, this kind of investment and developing really nonpartisan support so that it doesn't become a partisan issue. I mean, it seems like one of the reasons the Europeans have been so successful is, um, you know, everyone understands the value of creating energy this way. And we sure could use some advice how to make this more of a bipartisan issue. Plugging the economic benefits, especially on job creation and proactively engaging communities that are worried that they might be losing out from the energy transition thinking people working in the oil and gas industry, coal miners, engaging those communities, reskilling, retraining them so they can work in wind and offshore wind. We're doing this actively in Poland, Romania, other countries in Europe. The oil and gas industry um, brings a natural set of uh, skills and experience which serves uh, very well in the offshore wind industry. But it's through engaging communities. Uh, people who fear that they might miss out. In Europe, we have this concept of the just energy transition, where we go in in the wind industry uh, to the, the shipbuilders in northern Poland, for example, to the coal miners in Poland, and say, look, you can come and work in our industry. Uh, and this is yielding success. Thank you. And I know, Mr. Pedersen, that uh, Vineyard Wind will have an opportunity to access some of the great talent in Rhode Island, particularly in the building trades, and we look forward to making sure your project is a success. And again, uh, I hope you'll be able to follow the example that Rhode Island set in the way to balance the importance of renewable energy with, and wind with uh, protecting the rights of our fishing industry to continue to, to thrive. So uh, thank you again for being here, and thank you, Mr. Keating, for calling this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Chair recognizes Representative Pfluger for five minutes. Yeah. Um, in, in lieu of making everyone listen to my voice and the, uh, the way that uh, it sounds right now, I, I do have something to submit for the record. Uh, but, but I will say that um, I, I want to make the point that my district in West Texas has more wind energy in my congressional district than the entire state of California. Yet, the source, and I've talked to many European ambassadors, um, this source of energy 
is not always reliable. Now, that may not be the, the case when it comes to offshore, but onshore wind energy does not provide baseload capacity. Um, Secretary, former Secretary of State Kerry said that in the hearing that we had with him recently when I asked him that question. And so I think it's important that as we, as we develop an all of the above approach to energy in every European country that I talk to, especially those that are on the, the front lines of Russia are very interested in affordable, reliable, consistent uh, energy. And so I, I appreciate this, uh, this hearing, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do have something to submit for the record, um, but I said that I would uh, keep it short so I don't, I don't make it painful for people to listen to me. I feel much better than what I sound. Uh, so um, again, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, I, I do want to continue to focus on reliability, uh, something that, uh, that that we struggle with in this in this sector. So I'll yield back at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Fluger. And, and as you're aware, uh, you'll have the ability to submit questions for the record in writing uh, and get responses as well. And that can be helpful and save your voice. We need your voice uh, on this subcommittee. So I appreciate your effort. Uh, chair recognizes now uh, Representative Phillips. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and greetings to our, to our witnesses. Uh, uh, my home state of Minnesota is the home to the Boundary Waters Canoe Area. Some of you may know it's the most visited wilderness area in the entire United States. And sulfide ore copper mining uh, is proposed for the wilderness's edge, and it has the potential to flow directly into the heart of the Boundary Waters. And while I'm deeply concerned about the possible harm to um, habitats that support fish and game and, and thousands of jobs, I'm equally concerned about the families that have relied on high wage mining jobs uh, for many generations. It is indeed a way of life in northern Minnesota. And I don't want to dismiss the threat uh, that adoption of cleaner technologies uh, poses to the economic livelihoods uh, of residents in my state and in many parts of the country, despite the importance of our migration to clean energy, which I wholeheartedly support. So my question to the witnesses is, in your respective experiences, um, how have you seen this change uh, affect communities? Uh, what steps do you think our United States Congress can take along with private companies uh, to ensure that communities uh, who are displaced by uh, climate initiatives, uh, trade and the transition to clean energy uh, can be kept whole and actually prosperous uh, in the future? And uh, whichever witness wants to start, I'd welcome it. Well, Congressman, I actually worked in Babbitt, Minnesota for four oh, wow. summers and uh, know every 21 mile long shoreline of, of Birch Lake. So this issue is very near and dear to me. And it's also something that I have a lot of respect for you on, right? I mean, I understand, um, you know, the uh, um, on it, in, in northern Minnesota, the, the challenges around identifying new job opportunities. But as I think about what we're doing in this country today by standing up offshore wind for the first time in this country, the kinds of com the, the component parts, right? I mean, if you just even think about the tens of thousands of pieces in an onshore wind turbine, we know that pieces of those are fractured and manufactured in 48 states today. And then you think about what the opportunity looks like for offshore wind, and it's really exciting to me because it's not just the wind turbines, it's the fact that we're gonna to need to train an entire new workforce to be able to go out to sea and build these, these turbines. And I think in that process, we're gonna to have to figure, we're, we're gonna to have to do things like um, the, 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 the Offshore Wind Jobs and Opportunity Act so that we have the ability to train up and create those jobs and opportunities, whether that's you know in the middle of the country or or on the coasts where these uh, offshore wind turbines are going to be built, and that's what our industry is very focused on. I think, as I said previously, we have great opportunity with the uh, with the conversation around the um, reconciliation package this year and some of the incentives, uh, tax policies, as 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 well as the training programs. Um, that are going to be so, so important as we're transitioning our workforce. And just as a random aside, I will be in your congressional district in uh, approximately a week and a half. Um, well, so visit. looking you know, forward to it. We're supposed to be there too, but who knows at this stage. <laughs> exactly. I appreciate your response and um, I couldn't feel, uh, I feel exactly the same. Uh, Mr. Dixon or Mr. Peterson? Yes, and thank you very much, uh, sir. 
in Europe, onshore wind farms uh, pay taxes to the local municipal uh, government. Um, so local communities are benefiting directly in, in a financial way. Uh, there are some models in some parts of Europe also whereby local citizens can take a financial share of the local wind farm. That works in some instances, not in uh, all instances. Um, but the key thing is to show the local communities, as Heather has said, that you know, they benefit from this. It brings jobs, it brings investments, it brings revenue. And we like to think in, in, in Europe, at least, that there are not many industries that are investing in rural communities. Yep, globalized industries tend to invest in the large metropolises. Yeah, and the wind industry is one of the few. It's going out there into the often overlooked rural communities uh, around Europe, uh, creating jobs and, and, and growth. And that's very positive. I appreciate it. And I see my time is running out, unfortunately, Mr. Peterson, but I, I did want to raise that issue because I know that you know, miners and, and those who are being displaced don't want to work in call centers or work in the local supermarket. They want they want jobs of a similar dynamic and uh, similar interests. And I think we have a responsibility to uh, elevate that and ensure that we provide those opportunities. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. I now turn the chair uh, to our Vice Chairman, Ms. Spanberg. Thank Ms. Spanberger, please unmute. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Schneider for five minutes. Uh, thank you. And I, I want to thank the uh, chair and, and vice chair for holding this uh, hearing. And I want to thank our witnesses uh, for, for joining us um, to this very important topic. And I just want to very briefly build on what others have already uh, talked about, and that's need to make sure we're training our workforce. Uh, the investment in, in wind energy you know, has the potential to create a, a very large number of, of quality jobs. We have to make sure we have the right uh, uh, skills trained and, and the people in the, in the right places. And given your experience, and I'll open it up to anyone on the panel, is um, as Europe has, has gone through this process, what are some of the Le most important lessons we can learn as far as overcoming obstacles and clearing pathways for people to get the skills they need to succeed in the industry. I, I could maybe Thank offer you. just a, a, a few uh, sort of observations from uh, from trying to put together the supply chain and the suppliers from the first project. I think, uh, as uh, uh, Ms. Cycle also alluded to, I think the ecosystem of offshore wind supply chain is actually extremely diverse. Even for the first project, I think we had more than 50 American companies from 21 states responding to RFPs and delivering services and products uh, to the first wind farm. And I, I think uh, once this industry becomes a truly American industry with manufacturing and uh, engineers and scientists, etc., there's a lot of industries already that have similar and adjacent skill sets, but don't have the specific skill set. So I think making sure that the projects uh, move forward, making sure that manufacturing uh, puts down roots in, in the US is a key component in doing that. And then I think there needs to be a public-private partnership for a manufacturer of any component to make sure that they can get assistance in quickly getting a workforce and getting it trained. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Dixon can also speak to in Europe, which I also think will be replicated here, we have seen a lot of ex-servicemen entering uh, this industry because they are used to working in you know, cross-disciplinary skills. They know electrical, they know uh, electronics, they, they know mechanical, and, and you can then fit them into this industry because we need, and then we can train them for the specifics of offshore. So I think number one is, is getting the industry off and going and then the public-private partnerships to, to quickly transition because a lot of the skill sets are here but we need to build on those and then uh, make them specialized for offshore. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Eichel, Mr. Dixon, any thoughts you want to expand on that? If I could add to that, that it's very important that there are clear vocational qualifications frameworks for renewable energies and for the different industries within them. Um, it's important that they should be designed with industry input and that the training and educational establishments should be following those frameworks yep so they're training people 
to have the skills that the industry needs. Um, I would echo what Mr. Peterson has said, uh, ex-servicemen and women, uh, former coal miners make very good wind farm operatives. It takes us only six months in Europe to train a coal miner to be an onshore wind farm operative, slightly longer for offshore wind. But we find with people who've come from the offshore oil and gas industry, they can be very effective in the offshore wind industry very quickly. Great, uh, thank you. And um, yes, I don't want to keep you off the plate. Did you want to add something or? Well, I would, I, the only thing that I would add quickly is it's not, it's not what, what we are seeing early days is it's not just the coal jobs um, that are transferable, but we, you know, for oil and gas workers, a lot of whether that's the construction of the sh of of the actual Jones Act compliant ships that are going to go and install these um, offshore wind turbines, or the you know the the opportunity um, that basically uh, th there's a lot there's a lot of skill overlap between the industries, and and we very much as ACP are focused on engaging with labor unions to figure out like where can we find that sweet spot to um, partner together. And, and um, I think the, you know, as things like establishing a grant program to, to spur offshore training, those kinds of policies, as we're thinking about, um, you know, what, what we really need to do to stand up this wind industry is keeping in mind that it is a specialized workforce, but we, but, you know, if we can build from what we have today, we're going to be better off. Great, uh, thank you. I'm out of time. I may submit the question for the record, Mr. Chairman, but we talked about service members. Uh, we have a, a bill we're working on separately is uh, boots to business, teaching service members to be entrepreneurs. One of the things I'd like to explore is the role of small businesses in developing uh, Europe's uh, offshore wind and if there's opportunities for US small businesses to expand on that. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. The chair, the chair, the chair. Chairman, and uh, as it has, as it happens, uh, uh, now I'm going to send it back to you for uh, your question. Uh, five minutes. Thank you for uh, all the work you're doing, uh, making this flow so smoothly. Actually, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much to our witnesses and to Chair Keating for arranging this important hearing. It's clear that offshore wind energy can be a job and clean energy creator. Uh, and it presents a real opportunity for transatlantic cooperation. As we approach this issue, uh, how we approach this issue will really shape American competitiveness on the world stage, including in relation to China. I'm proud to represent Virginia's seventh congressional district. And while my district is not coastal, I am well aware of the opportunity offshore wind presents to my Commonwealth. In July, oh, excuse me, in June 2020, Virginia became the first state in the nation to stand offshore wind turbines in federal waters. And our state is expected to be one of the nation's leaders in terms of megawatts produced. Researchers also estimate, estimate that the offshore wind industry can create thousands of jobs in Virginia. These are high paying jobs and the benefits will not only be felt on the coast. Uh, so to follow up on that point, Ms. Michelle, I was wondering if you could speak a bit um, to uh, the fact that, you know, investment in offshore wind will certainly benefit coastal communities, but the potential economic benefit really can extend much farther beyond the coasts. How else can American workers and businesses benefit from the focus on offshore wind energy? Um, and, and could you briefly describe some of the downstream impacts that will be felt throughout the United States? Uh, great, thank you for, for your question. I also think it's, it's um, I, I wanna thank you for acknowledging the important role that states like Virginia um, can play in um, when, when it comes to not only solving for clean energy, but also creating new economic opportunities. That's obviously our sweet spot and something we focus on um, every day. 
Uh, and in fact, we, um, as the American Clean Power Association, did a recent analysis and looking at what, if you did, were to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind, um, you know, you have the opportunity to generate about 400,000 job years over the next decade. Um, and so you pair that with smart decarbonization policy and then kind of the investments we're talking about in worker training as well as um, uh, support for, um, uh, you know, manufacturing and development in, in our ports. And you can, you can really think about the economic, those economic opportunities, you know, really taking a meaningful role in our, in our port communities, but we're also, um, as some of the other, uh, as some of the other witness mentioned, focused on what we can do to create, um, jobs and focus on a just transition. Um, you asked sort of how, what other, what other benefits are there beyond the economic benefits? And, and as I think about um, the ability to, to deploy clean energy, um, the ability to you know, do that in a way that is not only looking at CO2 emissions. <laughs> in many instances, our port communities have some of the most um, aggressive air quality challenges. So. As I think about it, there's the economic piece of it, but then there's the public health and environmental aspect that I, I think are gonna be a real win for, um, for Americans across the country. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. Thank you so very much. Uh, well, Ms. Michelle, it's, too bad that Mr. Cicilline was not here to hear the wonderful shout outs that you had for Virginia as he spoke so uh, lovingly about uh, his own state. But I was wondering in the brief amount of time that we have left, um, if you could just speak, uh, you uh, or Mr. Dixon could speak briefly to China's rapid growth in offshore wind um, and how we can ensure that the United States and Europe are best competing to ensure that the international market is diversified. Uh, certainly seeing strides forward in wind energy is important, uh, but I, I do want to ensure that we are um, uh, watching potential uh, international markets or, or some of the challenges that we might see with uh, the, the rise of other powers in this space. Absolutely. And the United States should take a backseat to no one when it comes to the deployment of offshore wind energy. And, you know, the, but the, the fact of the matter is we are behind, which is why the decisions that are being made today are so important. Because if we want to build that domestic supply chain, if we want to be the leader we know America can be, we're going to have to get really clear and focused on what are the policies that we need in order to build that opportunity out. But also equally important is the fact that we need certainty and predictability in the permitting process. The fact we cannot wait nine years to permit a single offshore wind proposal, right? Like that's not a workable solution. Um, so we want to focus on working with the administration as well to figure out how do we put in place um, like the permitting and leasing processes that are going to help us lay the strong foundation and create that certainty and predictability for this to be an attractive place for industry to invest and build out offshore wind. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, again, thank you for, uh, this has actually gone through quite seamlessly. Uh, uh, I put myself at the end trying to work this through in terms of questions. So I now recognize myself for some questions and uh, I'm glad I did. I, uh, it gives me an opportunity sometimes uh, that I don't always have. Um, I'd like to try this and see if this helps. Uh, if there's been one common thread, particularly uh, Mr. Dixon, uh, Ms. Cycle, uh, you emphasize time and time again uh, today, the need for certainty, predictability uh, going forward. So what I'd like to do, uh, because I know uh, these were tough waters to, uh, to cross in our own domestic, uh, you know, offshore, uh, wind project and, and vineyard wind. I know a lot of things happen. I mean, you mentioned uh, certainty of permitting, uh, certainly uh, cer certainty in terms of some of the governmental tax credits and other things that are there uh, to keep your capital investors together. Uh, then unintended consequences, uh, whether they be 
uh, legislation or legal challenges that occur, it's, it's very difficult. So what I want to do is ask Mr. Peterson, uh, you've gone through this and continue to uh, go through some of these uh, challenges. Can you, uh, you know, share with us some of the challenges in terms of certainty that we've faced? This is the first major project, commercial project, and we, we, we want to use it not to just get through, but to learn from it. So if you could uh, share with us some of the things you've had on your project or some of the things you encounter uh, going forward to get to this point, we've gone to a good point. And then I'd like to ask Mr. Dixon and Ms. Zeichel to react to the issues that you brought forward and maybe lessons learned. So uh, first I'd like to ask Mr. Peterson and then hopefully I have Mr. Dixon and, and, and Ms. Zeichel uh, follow up. Thank you, Chairman Keating. Yeah, no, it's true that uh, especially the Vineyard Wind One project that has been through uh, a, a, a challenge in, in making sure that uh, we got through the federal permitting process in particular. And I think as an example, and I, I think this is well known that originally we were put into a, a federal program that would yield an answer after 18 months and right before the finish line, there was a decision to study a, a wider group of projects that then uh, for this project uh, meant that we ended up uh, taking three and a half years. And, and I think solutions need to be found that there's more predictability. Uh, no one can determine the outcome of a permitting process. All stakeholders need to be consulted and all voices need to be heard. But the timing is uh, very key. And uh, as a, an example, the, the Vineyard Wind project in, in the summer of 2019 was uh, fully contracted. We had booked vessels because you need to do them ahead of time. We had bought uh, raw materials, uh, steel and, and uh, contracted uh, manufacturing slots. And of course, that is a significant impact uh, both in the financials of any project, but also in, for the confidence of the industry if there's not a predictable way of, of getting to a decision. So I think uh, permitting is absolutely key. I think uh, great strides have been made in, in ensuring that the permitting is moving forward, but it's clear that with the growth of the industry, also stakeholder outreach, both the fishing community that has been raised here, but I would also say other stakeholders living along the coastlines, uh, thinking about how we can avoid that uh, these uh, stakeholders that may not have as many resources as the companies like I'm representing can be heard in a meaningful way uh, and that hearings uh, are not overly repetitive, but we can also ensure that we get a meaningful dialogue uh, across projects, uh, across states. I think that's a that's a key lesson as we scale, scale up this industry. One observation, Chairman, about China, if I may. China will build a lot of offshore wind, and there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, that's what they want to do. Fine, good. The key thing is that we remain ahead of China in the quality of the technology and in the technology that we apply also to integrate wind power in the wider energy system. And there has been much discussion about the question of reliability. Congressman Pfluger raised it, Congresswoman Titus raised it. The offshore wind turbines now have capacity factors of 50% or more, so they are much more reliable than they used to be when wind energy started. In addition, we're investing in grid technology that helps us balance variable supply with variable demand. And the grid investments have a key role to play in managing the variability of wind power, whether offshore or onshore. The wind is always going to be blowing somewhere. And the key thing is to ensure that the grid infrastructure allows us to transmit the wind where it is blowing to where it is needed by consumers, both household and industrial. Now, uh, before uh, Ms. Eichel answers, uh, uh, it, it's just interesting to know, too, the importance of domestic supply and, and reliability there, because modifications necessary, as certainly there was uh, in, in the Vineyard Wind Project, modifications necessary. And sometimes with China, uh, there's a history of not being that adaptable uh, to that modification. And that's why I think one reason uh, that's important to have a domestic supply is to have that potential too, because delays could be more costly uh, in dealing with it. Particularly, as you were saying, Mr. Dixon, the interfacing with the grid and some of the other issues. It's not always a set 
program. So, Ms. Cycle, your, your thoughts. Well, I think you're, Mr. Chairman, you're a thousand percent spot on. As I think about what we need to do to stand up off for wind in this country, there's sort of three three legs of the stool, uh, three, three, three legs. The first is supply chain incentives. Um, how are we gonna build the supply chain here in America and create those good jobs? The second is permitting and leasing. We, as, as I said, we need certainty and predictability. We need to make sure that the agencies are working together, making timely decision, and that those agencies are well-funded in order to deliver against that mandate. And then the last piece of it is that we need a trained workforce. Um, we don't have that today. So how are we going to build that? What are the, you know, what's the role of Congress in identifying those new opportunities and, um, you know, looking at uh, you know, the wind, the offshore wind jobs and Opportunity Act and other programs like that. So those are those are the three core components. And, you know, I think the the challenge for us is whether we're in industry or in government is trying to figure out like what are the collective solutions that we can bring to the table to make sure we don't miss this opportunity or that we outsource this opportunity to other countries like China. And that's that's what we're focused on and, and we're really happy to have this conversation with you today because I we're we're not going to fix this overnight and it's a complicated sort of 3D chess game, um, but something that we are, as an industry, really looking forward to working with you on going forward. And, and uh, also, I mean, that, that's an excellent way to summarize as we get near the end. But it it's also uh, draws into uh, the importance of that kind of, those three-legged stools all being in place, because I look at the Vineyard Wind Project, which I'm most familiar with, and, and just in the course of that project, technology changed and it changed dramatically. The size of the blades, they were able to adapt. So there's no reason to think the technology is not gonna to continue to change uh, and, and make things more efficient, but that requires a support system in place as you're going through those changes. So, uh, I mean, you went through it, Mr. Peterson, uh, with the change in technology. And again, Europe has been ahead of the US in dealing with this and the technology changes that are there, but uh, how important, what, what do we need for a basis, knowing that technology is gonna change as we uh, go through? It's gonna be changing in Europe too, going forward, but it's gonna be changing here. So uh, what are some of the lessons learned there? Uh, technology development is a, is a key uh, component in, in maturing this technology and, and, and continues to drive down costs to the benefit of ratepayers, but also making sure that we utilize that valuable resource that is the outer continental shelf in the most efficient way. Um, I mean, I've, I've worked in, in the European offshore wind industry and uh, what I've seen in the US uh, over the last five years is all the skills are available. You know, there are some of the best universities in the world, some of the most high tech companies manufacturing capabilities are available. So I think if we can get a concerted effort on putting the pillars in, and I fully agree with what Ms. Eichel said, and then I would mention the, the ports. It, it is a marine construction industry. We are building very large, heavy, bulky components. And if we don't have those ports, we can't unlock the potential that this industry has for ratepayers uh, and also for, for jobs and economic development. So. Uh, it, there's nothing that is missing. Uh, I'm sure the technology will transfer because the market size is, is large enough and there will be a friendly competition with companies developing technologies on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think that's gonna be the benefit of Europe and for the benefit of the US in the long run. I think that uh, when you look at what's occurred uh, in uh, your project, in, in our project in New Bedford, one of the significant things the Commonwealth of Massachusetts made a major investment too in that terminal on the port to be able to handle that ahead of time. So it shows that, uh, how different levels of government working together are important. Uh, and, and you've had uh, not just different levels of government in Europe, Mr. Dixon, you've also had uh, different countries uh, involved in cooperation in these areas. How important is that? And, and what have you learned from your experience? So one very small example Every country in Europe has different rules, different certificates for the health and safety of workers involved in offshore wind. That is inefficient. It means that uh, companies uh, that are operating in several countries cannot deploy their workers in all of those countries. 
each time they have to find local workers who have the relevant health and safety certificate. And we're working very hard with the national governments on this. Please align your health and safety rules. Yep, it would save us a lot of money. One other small observation on the permitting. It is so important that it is always possible that the permitting rules always allow the most updated recent technology to be deployed even if that is different from the technology that was specified in the original permit application. If the permit application has taken many years to go through, you may find yourself lumbered with an old technology that's much less efficient than the latest technology. You may even struggle to find manufacturers still making those turbines. So the permitting rules must allow that flexibility. That's a, that's a terrific point. And when you look at artificial intelligence and other changes that are gonna occur, that's going to be a situation. Uh, I'll just follow up and close the question with perhaps either uh, Ms. Cycle or Mr. Peterson reacting to what Mr. Dixon had just said in terms of uh, uh, any analogies to state or municipal governments and the importance of cooperation beyond the one I cited with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts making a major investment in that term in New Bedford. Yeah, so I guess. I, I almost take one big step back and say, you know, look at the history of the clean energy sector. We are a very nimble industry. Right now, today, we are we are putting projects on the books that are hybrid, you know, wind plus storage projects. And those wind turbines, that technology continues to advance. Battery battery technology is changing like almost on a daily basis. So, but what we've seen is if if we've got our, you know, federal regulations and our state regulations aligned and we're able to um, you know let industry bloom because that because we're going to only continue to see cost decrease and um, technology improvements it truly is about how do we how do we take advantage of this opportunity across the board how do we make sure we continue to to create a nimble space for you know in in the regulatory environment for new technology those are the things that are going to make or break us uh, going forward. And, and I guess I would just point to the very rich history of our being able as an industry to step up and to, to succeed in this space. Any closing thoughts, Mr. Peterson, on that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I have hardly been part of uh, any industry with uh, as much excitement as the U.S. offshore wind industry is seeing right now. I think we see tremendous interest from global companies that want to work in this space and i think the opportunity is here and it's now and i think uh, if i take what mr dixon says i think really looking to those small things trying to break down the barriers that have and create can create massive inefficiencies both in terms of cost but also in timing to move these forward and also still while still allowing for the valuable input from all the stakeholders who, who, who will see a, a change the ocean environment and a change waterfront. I think if we can do that, I, I think uh, US offshore wind uh, is, uh, is an industry with an extremely bright future. It's, it's, it's just one of the best uh, places in the world to build offshore wind. Yeah, part of my business school background, still relevant, as uh, old as it may be, uh, and that's the concept of project teams uh, with different uh, jurisdictions all sitting down together in the planning stage so that you're not having one uh, regulatory agency or one jurisdiction make a decision and, and it's not sequential, you know, so that they're waiting for that to happen. Then they're moving forward. If you can work as a project team going forward, as I saw in some instances in Massachusetts, where the state and the Commonwealth was working with federal officials and uh, communication and timing things, it, it really could be a, a, you know, a game changer in terms of giving more certainty. So on that note, uh, I want to thank you all. This is really, uh, I must tell you, uh, the panel that we had just complimenting each other from different perspectives and giving advice is something I hope uh, that we can call on in our committee in the future, the three of you, because uh, I found through this hearing, uh, working through a challenging time uh, of balancing uh, other duties here uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, I found it uh, extremely informative uh, as to where we are, we have to look in the future, what we can do to make things smoother going forward. But I, I hope we can count on you too uh, to continue to give this guidance. I think it was, will be extremely helpful. We have someone going through it in the U.S. right now 
someone that has a U.S. perspective and an understanding of the Hill and politics uh, as well, and someone in Europe that, uh, you, know, you know, the trailblazers in this industry are in Europe and, and the similarities are there, what we can learn uh, from that experience, and hopefully what we can cooperate together. Uh, we mentioned at the outset, we won't have the ability, clearly don't have it now, won't have it in the near term, uh, of having a project, you know, having a production chain in personnel, trained, educated personnel, and in certain pieces of equipment available to us. So there's going to have to be cooperation uh, across the Atlantic in this regard as we build our own production chain here in the U.S. on, on many of these things. So there's great opportunities for jobs, great mutual benefit moving forward on this. Uh, and I know that uh, it was important some of our members uh, brought up the idea of China. And, and a reminder to us, if we stand still, they continue to go forward. And all those production chain issues that we might have seen through the COVID pandemic, all those uh, port issues where they're trying to vertically integrate, owning the ports, doing this, having greater control, uh, we're going to face those problems if we don't move ourselves forward. And the greatest partners to have in this are our transatlantic partners. Uh, and if we work together on this, we'll put ourselves, and when I say ourselves, I don't mean just the U.S., the U.S. and Europe, in a much stronger position. So uh, I think that's one of the messages going forward uh, as we look at things in an international sense. And I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, the vice chair. If you have any closing remarks, uh, you're welcome. But thank you for making this a seamless hearing, much, uh, turning out much better. I even had members, by the way, on the floor as we tried this for the first time, say, we should do this more often. This is easier. So uh, thank you so much uh, for being a part of this. And, and I hope we can count on uh, your wisdom and experience uh, going forward. Uh, with that, uh, this committee is adjourned. Thank you.